All right, he's on Facebook. Mm. Pulling Periscope up. Two. Uh, let me get my phone right. I was trying to get my phone right. I'm going to just have to unplug it. All right. Always something. <laughs> All right, Prophet David Taylor here. Four. Second Thursday night. No more jeans. Now. Some of you that might be new to watching me may not understand what I mean when I say no more genie. Okay, I encourage you, I strongly encourage you to watch this video series from the beginning and you'll understand it a lot better. But when I'm talking about no more genies, what I'm talking about is getting rid of a genie concept of God. Because there are a lot of people that have a genie concept of God. They think that God is a genie or a butler or their servant or that he's just magic. And that he just does what he does because of magic. That all you have to do is say the magic word or wave a magic wand or say the magic phrase, whatever. And then all your dreams come true and all this stuff happens and that's not right. And that's how people have even done things like <clears throat> lost their children. Uh, I talked about this when I first started this series, but some people refuse to take their children to the doctor because they, they say, well, we just believe in divine healing. Yeah, but God gives us doctors too. God also gives us food from the ground, medicine and a whole lot of things that are natural or homeopathic. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things God gives us for the healing of our bodies, but they say, no, God has to answer this way. It has to be this way. And so they're not open to how the spirit might be leading. And some people have lost their children. Some people, their children have died. See, that's a genie concept of God where you think you just rubbed a lamp and you get to tell God how to answer you. And you think you get to tell him how to do it, when to do it, all that different kind of stuff. And, and that's not the way it works. That's not who God is. God does things to glorify himself. But you have to be open and you have to be willing and you have to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Why would the Lord say seven times in Revelation chapters two and three, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. If we didn't have to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying to the church, why would the Lord say that? That's what I mean. See, so people that are fighting that or people that don't know what I'm talking about or people that think you can just live any kind of way you want and then just kind of pop your fingers and call God and he's going to fix it. As a genie concept, as if God was, you know, the blue genie living in Aladdin's lamp. And that's not the Lord. Okay? So uh, that's why I started this series called No More Genies. This is actually my 25th message in this series. So you can, if you're on my Facebook page, you can go back and look at all the videos. Look them up, hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG for No More Genies. You can also look them up on my Periscope, same hashtag. Hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG, and they're also on my YouTube channel, okay? So I strongly encourage you to go back and look at these videos from the beginning because I go into more and more detail, especially at the beginning, about exactly what I mean about genie concept because you would be amazed at how God has to deliver you from a genie concept of him. You'd be amazed at how, especially if you got used to the Lord doing things a certain way, about how when God shifts, about how when the Lord turns, about how if there's a different move in the spirit, about how, how sometimes we're resistant of that, sometimes we're angry, sometimes we're confused. Sometimes a lot of things happen because we're so used to God answering in a certain way. And if you call on the Lord and it looks like you didn't get an answer, that is not true that God didn't answer you. What is true is that he just didn't answer you in the way you thought. So he's calling you to <coughs> whatever the new thing is, okay? And if you want scripture for that, that's what the Lord meant when he let down that sheep with all the four-footed unclean beasts in front of Peter in the book of Acts and told Peter to rise and eat. And Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean, nor has it touched my lips. And God said his famous words, that which I have cleansed, don't you call it come. God was telling Peter that those same Gentiles that yesterday were heathens and pigs and dogs are not a part of the covenant of promise. Those same Gentiles are now 
your brothers and your sisters and the same Gentiles now have the Holy Ghost just like you do, for the same reason that you do, because they believe. And Peter had to turn his back on a lifetime of religious Orthodox training like that in a moment of time. The Lord challenged Peter and asked Peter, was he following him or was he following his religious teaching and training? Because the Lord moved, he shifted and he opened the kingdom to the Gentiles. And all those that were Hebrew up to that point had to make a complete radical shift in their thinking and understanding that those that ate bacon and ate ham and worked on the Sabbath and worshiped idols, the people that did all those things that before were far away from the covenants and promises of God, now they had the Holy Ghost, just like the Hebrews, because they believed in Jesus. It was a complete shift. That's why Peter and John and Paul, uh, well, James got killed early. You remember James got killed with the sword. Apostle Paul, that's why they had such a hard time preaching and teaching the kingdom of God when they first started out, started out because it was radical. It was something the world had never seen before. Teaching Jewish people that you're not justified by works, that is not your keeping of the law that actually makes you right with God, and that was never the point of the law. That was a radical concept, okay, for a lot of their contemporaries and teaching Gentiles, people that are non-Jews, that you too can have a covenant promise with the God of heaven, and you have it through his son. And it's not based on anything that you do. It's not based on works, but it's based on his shed blood and your faith in that blood. The radical concept, those people had never heard anything like that before, especially if they worship different pantheons of gods and had their own way. You see what I mean? So that's why Peter and Paul and John and all the early church, that's one of the reasons anyway, why they went through so much because they were preaching and teaching something the world had never heard before. And it was a radical shift away from what a lot of people had seen up until that point. Because the Lord moved, he shifted, okay? And when there's, whenever there's a shift in the spirit, then the Lord's always gonna tell the prophet. It's always gonna come through the prophetic because that's what he promised. Surely that the Lord God will do nothing unless he first tell his servant the prophet. So the Lord is going to send a prophetic word when he moves, when he shifts, when he changes, when God is doing something new, he's going to send a prophetic word. That's why you need to be around the apostolic and the prophetic. That's why you need to have the prophetic in your life. That's the very reason. If for no other reason than whenever the Lord is moving and what direction he's moving in, that you're ready for it. Because without that prophetic word, without that prophetic warning, without knowing where the Lord is or what he's doing, you can completely miss God. And when I say completely miss, I mean you can completely miss God. People do it all the time because they miss the Lord. Now, I'm going to get into the lesson in a minute, but I just feel like I need to share all this. That's what happens to a lot of people. A lot of people were on track for stuff. A lot of people were doing great things. A lot of people were doing whatever, whatever. And then the Lord took a turn, or they took a turn. The Lord didn't move, but they moved, and they completely missed God. And then some people end up living in the wrong city. And then some people end up married to the wrong person. And then some people end up working on the wrong job. And some people end up doing all kinds of things that weren't the perfect will of God. It's because you missed him. You missed him. Either he shifted, and you didn't shift with him, or he stayed right where he was and you moved and you got off the path that you were on with him together. And then you ended up someplace you weren't supposed to be. Is there a Bible example of that? Yes, there is. Samson. The Lord told Samson's parents before Samson was born that he was going to be a Nazarite from the womb, meaning he wasn't supposed to drink wine, a strong drink. He was supposed to stay sober. And he wasn't ever supposed to cut his hair. That was a sign of his covenant with God. And Samson got involved with Philistine women. He got involved with women that didn't believe what he believed. And then eventually he got involved with Delilah. And Delilah was hired basically in a prostitute kind of way. Delilah was hired. They paid her to seduce him and find out the source of his strength. When she did, she cut his hair and then his strength left him. And the Bible says that the Lord had withdrawn from Samson. In other words, the anointing lifted off of him because Samson broke his covenant. And he didn't even know 
but the anointing was gone. So when Delilah said, the Philistines be upon you, Samson thought he could just get up, shake himself, get his strength going, and there was no anointed flow. He found himself just with the strength of an ordinary man. He had lost the anointing for a super strength. They blinded him, they captured him, and they put his eyes out. Then they chained him in a coliseum and made fun of him in a round with everybody laughing at him. Because Samson broke his covenant with God and missed the Lord, and the Lord backed away from him. And Samson turned away from what he should have been doing and got involved with somebody that he shouldn't have been involved with and got out of the will of God. And the Lord backed away from him and his anointing lifted off of him because he cut his hair and he violated his covenant with God. So that's just one example of many of how you can completely miss the Lord. If you want something more practical in our daily lives is, is if, like I said, you could be living, okay, there are a lot of people that are in Chicago right now that God told them to move a long time ago. There are a lot of people where your spouse is in another city, but you refuse to move out of Chicago. So you've been here, but God called you to go somewhere else. God called you to be somewhere else a long time ago, and you just didn't go. Because you didn't want to go, or you didn't believe, or whatever. You just didn't go. Okay, those doors don't stay open forever. And so a whole lot of people ended up, ended up missing their destiny because they weren't in the right place at the right time. Because God had had something set up for you, but in his will, it was for you to be somewhere other than where you had always grown up. He called Abraham out of his hometown, remember? And God, there was someplace else the Lord wanted you to be, and you just didn't go. And that's why some people have just been wandering in the wilderness. They've been wandering in circles for years now because they miss God. God sent a prophetic word, and they didn't want to hear it, and they didn't want to do it. And they just missed the Lord, okay? And those doors don't stay open forever. They do not stay open forever. That's why the scripture says, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Why would God say something like that if, if it doesn't matter if you could just do whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, and still get God's full blessing? You see that? That Once again, that's genie concept, Okay? That's something I call the false prosperity gospel. Okay, there's no such thing as prosperity gospel. You know, whatever prosperity preacher, there's no such thing as prosperity gospel because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. Prosperity has always been a part of following God. You can't find anyone that obeyed God that didn't prosper. So there's no such thing as prosperity gospel like it's a separate thing. There's no such thing. Wealth and riches, property and land, financial increase has always been a part of following God. It's not a separate thing. Okay? But there is such a thing as I call the false prosperity gospel. Do you want to know what the false prosperity gospel is? The false prosperity gospel says that you can just live any kind of way you want to live and just do whatever you want to do and God will bless you anyway. That's what a lot of people are into. That's what a lot of people have preached and taught, and that's what a lot of people have believed and received over the years, and that's why, again, they end up shipwrecked or they end up someplace they didn't want to be, because they really believe you can just live any kind of way you want to, and God will just bless you anyway. Not the truth. Not the truth. That's never been true. Why would God spend all that time in both Old Testament and New, Old Testament and New, telling you to obey him and to keep his commandments and to live the way he's telling you to live if it didn't matter how you live. But there have been a lot of people that have preached and taught that somehow how you live doesn't matter, what you believe, what you confess, and the choices that you make don't matter because God's just going to make his will come to pass anyway. Not the truth. Okay? So that's just a little refresher for those of you if this is your first time watching and no more genies teaching. That's what I'm talking about. That we no longer want to operate in that genie concept of God that has all those wrong concepts and wrong ideas, but we actually want to operate in a biblical concept of God, what the Word actually says about who God is and what we're supposed to do, what our part is in the name. So tonight, the Holy Ghost told me to continue teaching some more on the kingdom of God. And what I've done for the past year was I taught on the parables of Jesus when the Lord said, the kingdom of God is like this. 
and the kingdom of God is like that, and the kingdom of God is like this, and the kingdom of God is like that. So if you want to watch those teachings, those have been like the last 12 to 15 teachings I've done, so you can review those videos on my Facebook page, on my Periscope, or on my YouTube channel. Tonight, we're also going to look at a couple of verses where the Lord talked about the kingdom of God and the spirit of God is going to give us some fresh revelation. So let's jump right on in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much. Lord, we can't thank you enough. Words would fail us, oh God. Our, our tongues are not adequate to give you the praise. So Lord, just please receive the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to your name. Please receive the lifting of our hands, oh God, and humbling of our hearts. For you are a great God. You are a mighty God. You are all wise, all powerful. You are unspeakable, oh God. You are beyond what we could ever imagine. And we thank you for the honor and privilege of calling you Daddy, calling you Abba Father, because of Jesus, not because of us, but because of his righteousness, his blood, and his name. So I should forgive me, cleanse me by his blood, forgive me for anything, by thought, word, and deed that's not right before you, and fill me with the Holy Ghost. Oh God, fill my mind, fill my heart, fill my words. Feel my hand gestures, feel every part of me so that you can breathe through me and everything that you want said will be said tonight and everything that you want released to your body through this prophetic teaching will be released. That you might be glorified, that the saints might be edified, and that the demons might be terrified. I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. Today's No More Genies teaching is going to be found in the book of Luke. Okay. Now, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke is the third book in what we call the New Testament. New Testament. Now, remember, I told you this on Sunday that the New Testament does not actually kick in until the end of the Synoptic Gospels, until the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus still was operating under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament because the Testament is like a will, and a will doesn't kick in until the death of the testator. So the New Testament does not actually kick in until Jesus died. So everything you read about the Lord doing, he actually did under the Old Covenant. Okay? So the New Testament starts when uh, Jesus died. So we're reading out of the book of Luke. All right? We're going to look at Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Okay? And I'm going to read several different translations. I'm going to start with the Berean Study Bible. When asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God will not come with observable signs. Nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is. For, you see, the kingdom of, kingdom of God is in your midst. Okay, let's read out of the New Living Translation. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, but the kingdom of God is already among you. Let's read one more translation. Okay. Let's read the ESV, the English Standard Version. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look here it is or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Very, very important, very, very powerful stuff. Why is it powerful? Because this is what makes the difference in the lives of Christians. This is where Christians get confused, okay? In the Bible, we can see the power of God. In the Bible, we can see the promises of God. In both the Bible and through the, the prophets, we can hear the prophetic words of God. But what do we want? We want it to manifest in our lives. What good does it do to just read it on the page? What good does it do to just hear somebody talk about it? What good does that do if it doesn't show up in your life? And that's the difference between believers. That's why some people actually obtain the promises of God and some people don't. Okay? So I will explain what I mean by that, but let's get deeper into the verses. Okay? So 
So when asked by the Pharisees, oh, Lord, here come the Pharisees. I could do a whole teaching um, on the sect or the, the movement or the people or the group of the Pharisees. But they were always challenging the Lord because they were trying to always pit Jesus against Moses. Because they said they believed very strongly in the Mosaic law. And they were always trying to pit the Lord against Moses so they could uh, find a reason to accuse him and say that he was a false rabbi and a bad rabbi because he disagreed with Moses. And I'm oversimplifying, but I'm saying when you see them show up in Jesus' teaching, they're almost always doing that. They're almost always challenging the Lord on a matter of the law. In this particular passage, because the Lord had been preaching the kingdom of God, the Lord had, had just got through healing somebody. And so they showed up and they asked the Lord, when would the kingdom of God come? Now, you need to understand something about the Hebrew people that were alive in Jesus' time. And here it is. Uh, the Hebrew people had long believed that uh, Christ would be the son of David. That's part of the Old Testament prophecies, particularly in the book of Psalms, where it was shown that Messiah would actually be called the son of David. That one of the names of Jesus was the son of David, that Christ would be uh, and when they were talking about the son of David, they were talking about King David, the greatest king of Israel, that Messiah would come through that bloodline and be called a son of David. Well, what they thought that meant was that Messiah was going to act like David would have acted. So what that means in practical terms is when, you, when they heard that Messiah was the son of David, they thought that meant that he was going to physically establish a kingdom on earth. And they also thought that meant that he was going to overthrow the Romans. And that's why most of the 12 apostles or disciples that followed Jesus, that's why most of them followed him, and that's what they were expecting. Remember when the Lord God arrested, people always say, and the disciples ran. No, they did not at first. At first they fought. Remember, Peter put out his sword, pulled out his sword and cut off the servant's ear. Then the Lord put it back, and then the Lord reminded them of what he'd been saying all along, that he was going to allow them to arrest him and take him to the cross. Then they ran. They were always expecting a fight. Okay? They were expecting a revolution. They were expecting Messiah to manifest the way King David would have done it. And King David would have girded up his sword and just started whacking folks. He just would have started killing the Romans until he killed as many Romans as he needed to until they surrendered. And then Israel would again establish their physical kingdom and they would no longer be under Roman captivity and they would get their land and their autonomy back. That's what they thought Jesus was going to do. And that's what they thought Messiah meant, or that's what they thought Messiah's way was going to be. They thought that by calling him the son of David, that his method and his way were going to be like the son of David. And that's not quite what the Lord did. There are times when he roared, for sure, like the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when it's time for us to pay for our redemption, he humbled himself and got quiet like the sacrificial lamb. And they didn't see that coming. They did not expect him to do that. And so when they asked when the kingdom of God would come, a large part of what they meant was, how are we going to know when that physical kingdom that's reestablished on earth, where we're back on top and we own our land again and we're no longer underneath Roman rule? When are you going to do that? Okay. And the Lord answered them in a way that I'm sure they didn't anticipate. The Lord said the kingdom of God will not come with observable sign. Okay? That word there in the Hebrew, I'm reading out of Strong's Concordance 3907, observation, careful watching, okay, inspection or ocular evidence. In other words, the Lord said it's not visual. It's not something that you can see with your natural eye. The New Living Translation says, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible sign. So once again, just like I talked about at the top of the broadcast, that was a radical concept in terms of the way they thought. It's not so radical when you understand that it makes all the sense in the world that an invisible, unlimited God would want to establish an invisible, unlimited kingdom. 
whenever you don't understand something, but especially if you read it in the Bible, but anywhere in life, whenever you don't understand something, let me give you a tool to help you understand. All you have to do to begin to understand something is to imagine the converse. If you don't understand something, except, especially if God says something or does things a certain way, and you don't understand why he's doing it that way, then what I want you to do is imagine the flip. Imagine if the kingdom of God was something visible and it was established like a city on earth. You know what that means? That means that you would have to take a bus, a plane, or a train to get to that city to get saved and to get things back and forth from God. If it really was established on earth, like going to Philadelphia or going to Seoul, Korea, or going to Hokkaido, Japan, or going to uh, uh, Richmond in Canada, if it, if it was an actual city like they expected, that means we would have to go wherever it was. And we couldn't get anything from God unless we went there. Just think about that, especially in the midst of a global pandemic. What if God wanted to send you a blessing and God said, well, you got to get on a train <laughs> and you got to go to, you know, uh, uh, Bloomingdale in Illinois. Or you got to go to Tampa Bay, Florida, because that's where the kingdom is. You see, it makes sense that God would set up an invisible kingdom an invisible, eternal kingdom. So where is it? And that's what the Lord talks about. And we're going to move on to Luke 17, 21, the next verse, where the Lord says, nor will people say, look, here it is, or there it is. For you see, the kingdom of God is in your midst. That's in the Brian Study Bible. In the Hebrew, that word entos, 1787, means within, inside, the inside, from inside, Okay. English Standard, Standard Version says, but behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Okay? New King James Version says, for indeed the kingdom of, <clears throat> kingdom of God is within you. Why is that so important? I'm going to tell you why. Because too many Christians have wasted too much time in their lives thinking that the answer was out there somewhere. Not understanding that the answer is already in it's already in here through the Holy Ghost in your spirit through the eternal, invisible kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of the world is always about working from the outside in and how it looks according to your race. So it is unto you for the kingdom of the world. According to your face, so it is unto you because people respond to you based on how attractive they think you are. That's the way of the world according to your race, but your ethnic background, so it is unto you, and according to your faith, okay, how attractive are you? So it is unto you. That's not God's kingdom. God's kingdom is according to your faith, so it is unto you. Not your demographics, not how attractive you are, not your gender, not anything observable, not anything out here with the senses, but rather the invisible eternal kingdom that's already with in you it's already within you the answer is not out there the answer is in here whatever it is you're talking about the answer is going to be birthed inside in your spirit in your faith in your imagination in the invisible first and then it's going to manifest out here what did you say i said it doesn't matter who you are or what you're talking about whatever it is that you want from the lord He's already released a promise in the Bible. He's already released his word. That means it exists in the invisible realm. But what you want is you want it out here where you can put your hands on it, where you can observe it, where you can have it in your life. That's going to happen by faith. You have to pull it from the invisible to the visible, which is the same way that God made the world in the first place. When God said, let there be light, he pulled light from the invisible to the visible out here where it could be seen. Then he shaped the light into the sun, moon, stars, constellations, the cosmos, the supernovas, the galaxies. Okay? And so that's why a lot of Christians have missed, have missed their answer from the Lord. Because they don't understand it starts in here. It's going to come from in here and come out there. And I'm talking about anything you're talking about. 
like higher education, like uh, finances, wealth. Uh, a whole lot of people have missed their financial increase because they ask God for money. Because remember, when I, when I started off earlier, remember I told you that <clears throat> we can become so married to the way God has done things in the past, or we can, we can become so married to an expectation of how God is going to answer you that you completely miss the Lord. And the reason that you completely miss the Lord is because you set up in your mind a way to say, well, it's going to look like this. Well, it's going to look like that. Well, it's going to be like this. Well, it's going to be like that. And then you kind of locked into that. And then the Lord was completely somewhere else. And that's how you missed it. You missed your answer. Not God didn't answer. That's why so many people have gotten upset. And that's why so many people have, have not understood what was going on. Because if you call on the Lord in the name of Jesus, and you call on God according to the word, and you call on God, as the Bible says, with a broken and a contrite heart, if you call on God with a humble spirit, the Bible says God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So if you call on God and your heart is right, and you, you know, he's going to answer you. But the answer may not look like what you thought, because this is a relationship, it's not a religion. And I have discovered in my walk with God that the Lord is never going to let you get married to a method. God wants you to be married to him. Okay? God's a person, not a set of rules. You hear me say that all the time. God wants you to be married to him, not to a method, a certain way of doing things. Okay? And so that's why you need three forms of word. You need the written word, the Bible. You need the living word, the logos, that's Jesus, the word becoming flesh. And you need the prophetic word, the rainbow word, the fresh breeze right now word of God. You get the fullness of what God has for you in this life. Because some things, you're, you know, there will always be a scriptural foundation. But which house should I buy is not actually in the Bible. Which college should I go to is not in the Bible. Now, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not to thine own understanding, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That is in the Bible. But, but I got five colleges, God, which one should I go to? It's not in the Bible. You're going to need a rainbow word for that. You're going to need the Holy Ghost to quicken your spirit for that. You're going to need to, for God to speak through the prophetic for that. And remember, you hear me say it all the time, don't know one person get all the revelation. Okay? Don't know one person. I don't care if you got the Holy Ghost running out your toes. Don't know one person get all the revelation. But God uses every member of his body, but God can also use anything. Okay? You can, you can be hearing a song. You can see an advertising on the side of a bus. I mean, you can't limit God. That's what I'm trying to say. So you have to stay open to however it is that the Lord might want to answer you. And so many Christians don't have that mindset, and that's how they miss God, because they got locked in to God answering a certain way, and it ended up not looking like what they thought. I am now convinced, I have now lived long enough to see that God has answered all of our prayers, but the answer might be walking around inside the body or the life of somebody that you don't talk to. There might be some open doors out there for you right now, and there might be some blessings that you live and you die and you never get. For example, one of my favorite scriptures that people seem to be locked into it being a certain way is when the Bible says that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that some people think that that means that sinners are just going to walk up to you and give you all their money. <laughs> that can happen, but what if it doesn't happen that way? Some Christians won't even talk to unbelievers. They're so righteous. They're so holy. They're so separate from the world that they won't be around unbelievers in any way, shape, or form. And they end up missing blessings because they just... Don't say hi because they just won't fellowship because they just won't be around. Unbelievers are, you know, and I don't mean, you know, fellowship, hang around them, let them mess up your faith or let, let them mess up your way of life. That's not what I mean. But I mean, just won't have any kind of communication with them. I like the way Bishop T.D. Jake says it. Bishop Jake says, you can't change or impact anybody you won't talk to. 
And the Lord taught to people from all kinds of walks of life. Once again, go back and read Jesus' life. Jesus did not just stay with his circle or his group or his anything. He talked to some of everybody. So I'm saying all that to say that you've got to stay open to however it is the Lord might want to answer you. And if it looks like God didn't answer you, the word says that he did answer. So that means you have to keep seeking his faith. You have to keep asking him, Lord, where's the answer? Lord, what's the answer? And what's my portion in it? So that's why the Lord said it's not going to come from your senses. It's not going to come from a visual observation. How is it going to come? It's going to come from within you, just like you said. Okay? So what that means in practical terms, it means that you got to believe God. And I talked about this on Sunday, but it bears repeating here. It means that your faith has to form everything on the inside before it can live out here on the outside. Let me say that again. Your faith and your inner man and your spirit, the breath of life inside of you, everything has to form on the inside before it can live here on the outside. In other words, if God called you to be a king, like he anointed King David to be a king, you have to see yourself as a king on the inside before you ever get on the throne. If you don't see yourself as a king on the inside, then physically setting you on the throne is going to do absolutely no good because you never believed it. You never took hold of it. You never laid hold of everything that God said he had for you on the inside. If you don't think like a rich person, if you don't change the way you see money, if you don't change the way you manage money, if you don't change the way you think about money, if you don't change anything like that, then it won't matter how much money gets put in your hand. Your money will always come down to the level of your thinking. It doesn't matter. If you think $30,000, then God could give you $30 million, and in less than six months, that $30 million will come down to $30,000. Because that's the image on the inside of you. If you want your money to go up to a higher level, then the image on the inside of you has to go up to that level first. And then you birth it out here. I talked about it on Sunday. I talked about the four steps to uh, increasing your faith. I repeat them here. Number one is you got to believe it. Number two is you have to receive it. Number three, you have to say it. Number four, you have to obey it. You got to believe it. You got to receive it. You got to say it. And you got to obey it. All right? So that's why... Number one, if you don't believe it, if you're an unbeliever, if you don't believe, you can't get anything from the Lord. Because that's the first step that you've got to believe. But believing it, believing that such a thing is possible, believing that such a thing can happen is just the first step. Second step is you've got to receive it. And receive it means it can happen for me. Receiving it means that God is talking to me. Receiving it means that I believe that this promise, this word I'm hearing, is for me. It can be a part of my life. That's what it means to receive something. Because just believing it means, yes, I believe God is able. And yes, I can believe such a thing is happening. But it's going to happen for me. Saying it is your confession, which is why you always have to watch what you say, because you cannot expect your faith to be working if you're saying something different than what you're uh, supposed to be believing. Because when God got ready to make the world, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost didn't step out there and say, that sure is a lot of darkness. That ain't what they said. They said, let there be light. They said what they wanted. They spoke what they wanted. They used their faith. Okay? So if that's the way they made the world, and we're made in their image, then that's the way we have to make our world, just like that. Believe it, receive it, you got to say it, and then you have to obey it. And by obey it, I mean you have to put some works behind your faith. You have to do the things necessary that line up with what you've believe, been believing, receiving, saying you have to obey. For example, the one I use all the time is that if God tells you to start a business, you have to, you have to get your government number. You have to come up with a name for a business or maybe the Lord will give you a name. You have to set up your bank account. The Holy Ghost is not going to set up your bank account for you. You have to fund your bank account. You have to do all You got to do all that. Okay, you have to do all that. You have to do all that. You have to add some works to your faith. You have to obey that word. Okay? There's been a lot of times I've seen people get prophetic words 
And they thought it was going to happen again by magic. But in that prophetic word, the Lord told them they had to abide in him. They had to be faithful to him. They had to do what he was telling them to do. They had to get their lives in order. They had to get their lives in line. They couldn't just keep doing what they wanted to do and get the blessing. And that's what they thought it meant. Okay. And whenever God gives you a prophetic word, you have to listen. If it's conditional, if it's conditional, the Lord say, if you do this, then you get this. Not this is just going to happen irrespective of what you do. So you got to believe it, you got to receive it, you got to say it, and you got to obey it. And all that gets your faith to working on the inside, and all of that forms on the inside of you, and that's how you pull it from the invisible to the visible, and it lives out here. That's how God's kingdom works. Now, you might say, why would the Lord do it that way? We already talked about that earlier in the broadcast. Because <clears throat> an invisible God that you cannot observe with your natural eye in an invisible kingdom that has no limit. God himself and his kingdom don't have limits. God and his kingdom are actually eternal. They're outside of time. They stretch all the way back to eternity past. That right now, all the way through eternity future, okay, God doesn't run out of money. God doesn't run out of any kind of resources. God doesn't run out of grace. God doesn't run out of anything. He's unlimited. So it makes all the sense in the world that God would say, his kingdom doesn't come through the senses. There's only so much your eyes can perceive. And if a light gets too bright, it shuts down or it blinds it. There's only so much sound your ears can handle. And then your eardrum will just burst. On and on and on. Your senses have limits. So it makes all the sense in the world that God would say that his kingdom is invisible. It does not come to the senses, but rather it is invisible, eternal, and it's in your spirit. It's in you. It's in the invisible world, in the breath of life inside of you. And so anything that you want, that you believe in God for, has got to form on the inside of you first. I'll give an example of some people that failed with a capital F. <clears throat> The first generation that came out of Egypt under Moses, they went through the wilderness. Well, well, first of all, before they even got out of Egypt, Moses brought all them plagues, or the hand of God brought all those plagues through Moses. Frogs, lice, river turning into blood, you know, death of the firstborn. And then when they were leaving Egypt, they spoiled the Egyptians. Moses told them to get all the money to get a recompense for all them years of being slaves. And they spoiled the Egyptians and took all their wealth. Then on the way through the wilderness, God filled them with water out of the rock, with manna that fell from heaven, and with quail that blew up from the ocean. Then when Pharaoh came after him and said, I'm going to give me my slaves back, God put up a pillar or a column or a whirlwind of fire to keep Pharaoh at bay. And then God parted the Red Sea. And then the children of Israel walked across the Red Sea on dry land. They all tried to chase him. The water came back down and killed him. Then people experienced all them miracles. And it wasn't just one person experiencing that. That was a nation that was at least, that was 600,000 men plus the women and children. So maybe we're talking about a million, maybe a million five people. They saw all that, got to the edge of the promised land and didn't go in because they didn't believe God. They saw the giants and said, oh, we saw giants and we're as grasshoppers in their sight and oh, we can't do it. You know what that meant? That meant that people were still small in the head. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that said, we are well able, we can do it, we can overcome. Because Joshua and Caleb had formed the image of being conquerors, of being landowners, of being possessors, of being those that could overcome challenges, of being winners. Joshua and Caleb had formed the image of being a winner on the inside. So that's why they said, even though there's giants in the land, those giants are bigger than our God. Our God always causes us to win. Joshua and Caleb said, we've been in situation after situation. Every time we get in situation, our God causes us to win. So we can take them giants. We can take that land. They're the only two that said that. Everybody else said, oh, Lord, we can't do it. We're tiny grasshoppers. I wish we could go back to Egypt. At least we could know what we were supposed to eat, blah, blah, blah. And God got so mad at them, he cursed them to wander in the wilderness until they died. And God said, I'm going to take your children. Why did they fall in the wilderness? Why did that happen? I'll tell you why. That happened because they never let go of being slaves. They still felt like slaves on the inside. 
They, that's why that's what came out their mouth. Notice what they said. They said, we're as grasshoppers in their sight. That means they went through all our God, didn't learn nothing. They didn't realize they were conquerors, just Joshua and Caleb. They did not form an image on the inside of being a conqueror, of being a landowner, of being a land possessor, of being someone that can overcome challenges, of basically being a winner. They didn't believe there were winners on the inside. They still felt like they were victims. They still felt like they were slaves. They still felt like, felt like that even after all that God had done for them, that the giants were going to take them out. And they died by wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until they all, that whole generation died out. And God took the children, their children. That's an example of people in the Bible that failed to grasp what the Lord is teaching in Luke 17, that the kingdom of God is on the inside of you. It's going to come through faith. So you've got to believe it, and you can only believe it when you hear a preacher or prophesied or taught like you're doing now. That's what apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are for, to release the word of God to you as directed by the Holy Ghost. So you got to hear that so you can believe it. But then you have to receive it and believe that's talking to me. Then you got to say it. you got to confess what the Lord said, and then you have to obey it. You have to put some works behind your faith and do the things that line up with your confession. You know what I mean? The Lord said, this is how my kingdom works. Now, how much more plain could the Lord make that? So if you are trying to get stuff from God and you're trying to do it by sight, or you have not actually received it, or you haven't developed your faith to form an image on the inside, that's why it's not manifest. Okay? You got to do it. It only works the way the Lord says it works. And the Lord said his kingdom doesn't come through sensory evidence. It's within you. That means it's, it comes from the invisible world. That means it comes through faith. And you got to pull it from the invisible to the visible. All right? Amen and amen. All right, that's the teaching for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Those of you that watch me live on Facebook, on Periscope, those of you that are watching replay, and those of you that are watching the YouTube video and listening to the podcast. Uh, when you see me uh, close my eyes, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there any more prophetic word he wants me to release? Anything, any demonic power that needs to be broken, any financial words, anything like that. So that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, I heard the word and I saw mustard, as in mustard seed, as in mustard tree. If you know anything about that parable from the Bible, a mustard seed is the tiniest of seed, but when the tree grows, it grows into this huge encompassing thing that envelops everything in touches. So what that means is that some of us are in the process of growing up like the mustard tree. No matter how tinily we started, I know that's not a word tinily, but I made it up. No matter how tinily or no matter how small you were when you started, the Holy Ghost is saying by the time God gets through it, everything he's doing in your life, you're going to be this huge tree that envelops everything you touch. Amen. I receive that. I believe that. I receive that. I, I'm going to say it and I'm going to obey it. Because it doesn't happen. I was just talking to my son about that earlier today. It doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't happen overnight. You've got to go from something to something. But if the Holy Ghost says that that's the process of what's happening right now, that means that for those that believe it, receive it, say it, and obey it, before it's all over, you're going to be this huge mustard tree that has swallowed up everything around you before it's all over. So amen, amen. I am excited about that, and I'll receive it, and I'm going to say it and walk in it. All right? God bless you. Check out my third quarter prophetic devotional where you can journal your own progress in the prophetic with God. I got a new book I'm writing. Check out my music on my Prophet David Taylor and Chase at the Cross page. Check out my 150 hymn project. The first Friday of every month, I drop a new hymn. You can buy the sheet music. I always have one video that's a lyric video where you can hear the hymn and see the words. But I also make a video where somebody sings it live. So check that out. That's on Facebook. It's called 150 Hymns. But you can also find that on my Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross YouTube channel. Okay, amen, and God bless you. I will be back on Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for um, 
my next live prophetic broadcast, uh, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time this Sunday. So be sure to check that out on Facebook, Periscope, Twitter, and YouTube. All right. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. And remember, the kingdom of God is not operating through your senses. It's operating through the invisible, through your spirit, through your faith. And according to your faith, so it is unto you. Amen. And God bless you. Put your praise.